All right, thank you, Mary Carroll. I appreciate the opportunity to come speak with you all today. This is a topic that um, I'm fairly passionate about and uh, something that's been uh, really sort of a popular topic in recent years. Um, there's a lot of, a lot of labels out there. Um, if you're a consumer and you go shopping at the grocery store, you've probably seen a lot of these labels out there. Everything from you know, GMOs to no GMOs to organic to you know, pesticides and that sort of thing that are in our foods. And so this is something that affects you as a consumer every time you go to the grocery store or make a, make a food choice for you or your family. Um, so today we're going to try to focus a little bit uh, more specifically on pollinator issues related to some of these farming myths uh, surrounding pesticides and GMOs uh, more specifically. Um, and this is an appropriate topic uh, today because this is uh, National Pollinator Week. Um, so um, this is a great opportunity to go out and and observe pollinators this time of year. They're very busy in my garden right now. And um, if you don't have a hummingbird feeder or um, some flowers in your yard to attract those pollinators, that may be something you wanna take the initiative to do and, and celebrate the uh, National Pollinator Week with us. Uh, so with that, I'll go ahead and get started. Um, our, um, our garden at home, we actually uh, do a, a fairly large vegetable garden. And um, you know, a lot of people ask me, well, why do you garden? Are you worried about pesticides? Are you worried about GMOs or whatever's in your food at the grocery store? And I have to be honest with you, those are actually the least of my concerns. As a extension professional and with the knowledge and background that I had in farming and agriculture, um, I even grew up on a, on a beef cattle farm. We actually live on the farm uh, with my parents now. We built a house there. Um, you know, those are actually not my reasons for, for growing a garden. Um, and so I listed at the top of the screen some of my reasons. Um, I like the taste, you know, fresh out of the garden. Um, I kind of like the idea of uh, keeping things locally grown. Um, if I can't grow it myself, I want to try to, you know, buy from a local source or a local farmer's market, uh, which helps support our local economy. Um, which, and it also reduces our carbon footprint from an environmental standpoint. That's, that's a good thing. Um, it's a great hobby. Um, it's uh, a good way to get exercise for me and my family. Um, we spent a couple hours picking the garden last night, uh, probably picked about 100 plums and a uh, basket of green beans, uh, lots of squash and zucchini. So this is actually what my garden looks like right now. Uh, the corn's tasseling, uh, the beans, zucchini, and squash are coming in really strong right now. So uh, it's a busy time of year in the garden, as y'all are probably aware. Um, the other advantage of, of gardening is you can have control over what goes into your food from a, from a nutrition standpoint. Uh, my wife happens to be a dietitian, and um, she's really good at canning and preserving food. Um, so we can control the amount of salt and sugar and preservatives that actually ends up in our food. Whereas if you're buying from the grocery store, a lot of times you're stuck with whatever they put in there. Um, and those things are probably a greater health concern than you know pesticides and other things as a general rule. Um, so those are things that we like to try to control. The other big reason is uh, this little guy standing here in the corner is my, my little boy. He just turned six last month um, and he likes to help me in the garden. And it's a great, uh, a great STEM experience for him to learn about science and, and pollinators and that sort of thing. And uh, we always plant a big cover crop in our winter garden uh, with clover. And he's actually holding up uh, with a bundle there of uh, crimson clover, uh, which is a great cover crop. And it usually blooms right around St. Patrick's Day every year. Um, so it's a great way to um, actually enhance um, you know, forage for bees and other pollinators. You'd be amazed um, even in, in March um, that that clover patch is just swarming with bees in our garden every year. So there's no shortage of bees and pollinators in our garden. Um, we also, you know, in a corner of our garden, we always plant some, some 
flowers, wildflowers like cosmos on the left there and zinnias um, in the center of your screen. Um, and those are great for bringing in pollinators. So we, we don't have any trouble, you know, bringing in bees and other things to our garden. And by the way, you know, there's more than just bees that pollinate. We've got, you know, flies, we've got uh, wasps and beetles and things that, that pollinate our crops as well. Um, and they're all attracted to these types of uh, wildflowers in your garden. So just, you know, a very small patch um, is all it takes to bring them in. Um, you can see the cows on our farm in the background. They get the uh, benefits of, um, you know, the squash or the zucchini that grows a little too big for our garden. We get to throw it over the fence and they, they get a little snack every now and then. Um, and I do have to be honest, I, I, you know, I do use pesticides in my garden, uh, but I use them only as needed. Uh, I tend to practice the integrated pest management approach in my, my garden and on our farm. Uh, so we minimize the amount of pesticides we have to use in the first place. Um, and also, if we do have to use pesticides, we choose those that are, you know, possibly the most, you know, benign type products on um, bees and pollinators to try to minimize the impact of those products that we have to use. Um, so again, you can do that in a way that you can coexist and still have, you know, bees and pollinators in your garden. So um, I want to start off our discussion today looking at, you know, where do you get your facts? Uh, a lot of stuff we're going to talk about today is, is in some ways controversial if you've uh, watched any of the, uh, you know, news lately, um, you know, you'll see all kinds of stuff going on out there. I mean, even COVID-19 seems to be getting politicized and there's science and then there, there's, you know, misinformation out there about, you know, how we should approach uh, these types of issues. Um, and so I would caution you, you know, there's a lot of things on this screen here that are not necessarily peer reviewed or scientific uh, sources of information. Um, and that's where I like to, you know, be very careful and look at the source and, and look at the motivation behind that source. You know, uh, what are these people getting out of them? Are they trying to sell you a book? Are they trying to sell you a movie? Um, are they trying to sell you a magazine? You know, question their motives and see if, if the information they're putting out there is really and truly valid. Um, and probably the biggest um, source of misinformation nowadays is, is the Internet, as you all know, I'm sure. Um, and if you go into, you know, any search engine uh, like we have here on the screenshot um, and just type in something like GMOs into a search engine, you know, it's genetically modified organisms. You know, what comes up? Well, you get 21 million results. Um, and I, again, say a lot of those results are not very uh, reputable. And what's interesting is the very first picture that pops up in that search engine is a picture of a tomato with syringes hanging out of it. So unfortunately, this is the perception that consumers have of genetic engineering um, and what that technology might mean to a consumer when they go grocery shopping. Uh, it kind of has a negative connotation if you see an image like that. Um, the irony of that image, and that's a, you know, from a Wikipedia article that pops up at the top of the search engine, um, is that there are no genetically engineered tomatoes on the market today. You can't buy that. It doesn't exist. Um, so, you know, that's the very first thing that pops up as an image, and, and yet that's also the most um, uninformative uh, as far as information there. Um, there are only a few genetically engineered crops that we'll look at here in a few minutes um, that are available to the public and that you can buy at the grocery store. Um, there was a tomato that was put on the market back in the early 90s called the Flavor Saver Tomato. Um, they did engineer it to try to um, increase the shelf life of that tomato. But interestingly enough, um, they engineered it so well that it uh, had a great stable you know, shelf life, uh, but had practically no flavor to it. And so, um, you know, consumer taste tests flopped, and they immediately withdrew that uh, tomato from the market, and they have never since tried to genetically engineer a tomato. Um, so all the tomatoes you see are, are just your traditional hybrids and things that we've um, been breeding for, you know, hundreds of years, uh, but they're not genetically engineered in a lab. That's what you see at the grocery store is, is just the hybrids. So um, here's a quick quote here that um, kind of brings home that point a little bit closer. Um, you know, Albert Einstein has famously uh, said apparently that if bees disappeared, mankind would have no more than four years left to live. Well, interestingly enough, um, he's, he's attributed to that quote. If you go on the internet, you'll find it just about everywhere. Uh, but interestingly enough, he never actually said that, and it's actually not even really a true quote. Um, we could live without bees. It wouldn't be a pleasant world. Um, a lot of things that we like to eat, um, 
you know, certain fruits and vegetables wouldn't be, be available to us, um, but we wouldn't probably starve to death necessarily. Um, so I caution you again, double check your facts and your sources. Um, and when you do use the internet, you know, just be very careful about, you know, what you're searching. I always like to add to my search engine, like if I was searching for GMO information, um, I would add to that search query, you know, .edu or .gov uh, to my search engine. And so that's going to narrow down those results to websites that I feel are, you know, more reputable, you know, either from government sources or, um, you know, from educational institutions and universities that end in .edu. Um, so they're going to be research-based and science-based uh, sources of information when I'm looking for information like that. Um, and again, if it's on the internet, it's probably not true. Um, just like the State Farm commercial there, there's a picture um, of that guy that comes up and um, she says, oh, I met this guy on the internet. He's a French model. And it's the guy with the glasses and the fanny pack and says, uh, bonjour, no, you know, and obviously he's not a French model, but she found him on the internet. All right, so looks like we still have people in the waiting room, so I don't know if that's, if you're making sure we get those people in. Um, so um, kind of looking at a little bit of a brief history of, of agriculture and farming and how we got to where we are today. Um, it's interesting to note that, you know, over the last, um, you know, 120 years or so, uh, from 1850 to now, um, we've basically, you know, been able to maintain the amount of land and farms. So that bottom line there on the graph, um, you know, is, re is relatively stable from the 1940s to now. In fact, we've actually seen a decrease in land used for farming and agriculture by about 10 or 11 percent. Um, and, and what's incredible is that in that same time span, the world population has actually increased by five and a half billion people. And so we're able to feed more and more people with actually less land today than we've ever had in, in you know, from a historical standpoint. Um, and that's really an incredible feat when you think about it. And, and some of the things that allow that to happen um, were things like, you know, the invention of, of um, synthetic nitrogen. Of course, the Germans, you know, figured out how to make, um, you know, ammonium nitrate during World War I. And, and of course, we learned that that's also a, a great fertilizer. Um, so we can thank, um, you know, the World War I for, for allowing us to have that technology, if you will, to make uh, fertilizer. Um, and of course, mechanized farming was a big thing that occurred in the 1920s with tractors and other implements that, that reduced the amount of labor required to maintain a farm. And so as a result of that, you can see the number of farms um, in the U.S. has dramatically declined since the 1920s. Um, we went from, you know, almost 6 million farms in the 1920s to uh, roughly 2 million farms today, and that, again, is, is a sort of a stable number at this point. Um, and then the other big um, <clears throat> advancement or technology, uh, if you will, occurred in the 1940s uh, with the discovery of herbicides. And herbicides are, uh, an, are a tool that farmers use, of course, for weed management. And that also dramatically decreased the need for labor on farms um, and increased the yield in our farms as well. And so that's also another reason why the number of farms and farmers has, has continued to, to decline. Um, interestingly enough, um, even though the number of farmers has declined because we don't need as much labor to produce that food, the average farm size has actually increased over time. Um, and so, you know, it used to be you could only manage, you know, a 20 or 30 acre farm because you're having to pull weeds by hand. Well, now with, with tractors and herbicides and other technology, um, you know, you can manage a couple thousand acres in, in a farm. Um, so the average farm size now is easily about uh, 400 acres. Um, and again, that's kind of the average. Um, and what's interesting is that when I poll people in an audience, I usually ask them, you know, what percentage of those farms are still family farms? And, and it's interesting, you know, more than half of the audience usually raises their hand and says, oh, it's, you know, less than 50% are still family farms, or less than, or much less than 50%, right? Um, when in fact, uh, USDA has done a lot of studies on this, and every year they do a, what's called a family farm report. Um, the number of farms in the United States that are still family owned and operated is roughly about 98%. And that's a shocking number to a lot of folks. Um, they think that, you know, there are these big factory farms out there that are growing our, all of our food. When in fact, it's still family farms. The only difference is there's just more land in those family farms um, that are being run by less and less people. 
I can skip this slide here. Here we go. All right. Um, another um, sort of result of you know being less having less land in agriculture and farming is um, our our forests have actually increased in a sense. And so in the southeast, especially, um, we actually have a lot of timber production. Um, you know, one fourth of the United States is actually in timberland now today. Um, and if you look at just the southeast, especially, um, a lot of that land used to be in cotton. You know, cotton was king. Uh, prior to the Civil War, um, and even up until the 1920s and 30s, cotton was a major crop, and it took up a lot of land space. Well, because of the technology and the increases in yield and farming, you know, we, we used to only grow like maybe 150 pounds of cotton to the acre. Today, we can grow a ton of cotton per acre, and so we don't need as much land to grow cotton anymore. So all that land that used to be in cotton production now has shifted back into timber, interestingly enough, or forest land. Um, so we actually have more trees today um, in Georgia and the southeast of the, of the general rule than we did even 100 years ago. Um, and again, that's because of advancements in, in farming. And so looking at our forest industry, just in Georgia, uh, timber production is a $17 billion industry and creates over 73,000 jobs. We have about 24 million acres of renewable commercial forest land, which is actually more than any other state in the nation now. Um, and that's um, still privately owned for the most part. 90% of those forests in Georgia are privately owned. We're number one in the nation for that as well. Um, in Georgia, again, um, you know, that land area is, is a big part of, you know, conservation, if you will, for wildlife and that sort of thing. 67% of our for, uh, of the land area in Georgia is covered in forests. Um, and in fact, it's such a big industry that two, the top two exports in the state of Georgia uh, by volume are wood pulp and paperboard. And that's more than the next three top commodities combined. Um, so that's a huge industry for the state of Georgia. So again, now that we have that sort of background knowledge of, of agriculture and where we are today, let's, let's look a little bit more specifically about the uh, GMO issue that we wanted to focus on. Um, and, and GMOs, by the way, um, that's sort of a, a catch-all phrase for um, genetically modified organisms. It's a very popular term that you hear in the media, uh, but it's actually very is probably the least descriptive um, because there's a lot of different ways that we can engineer crops um, and we have different terms to sort of explain that uh, like transgenic, cisgenic, and intragenic and that's just how we move genes around in different ways. Um, so again GMO doesn't really tell you which one of those methods we're using to genetically modify the crop um, but regardless you know the idea there is that it's being manipulated in a lab okay that's kind of the underlying uh, connotation there. Um, so at the end of the day, what are we doing? We're, we're either, you know, modifying the genes by rearranging them, or either maybe even taking genes out and eliminating them. We can silence genes kind of like a light switch. You can turn them on or turn them off. Um, you can edit them and change the code. Um, you can even transfer genes between uh, different species of organisms as well. Um, and of course, in the 90s, when we first started using this technology, the gene transfer um, was probably the most controversial. Uh, but interestingly enough, that's becoming less and less common um, as far as the preferred method for genetic modification nowadays. Um, we're seeing some of these other things like silencing and gene editing um, being more, um, more common and actually cheaper uh, than the transfer of actual genomes. Um, so why do we do this? Well, essentially it's, it's to improve uh, a crop's uh, tolerance or resistance to certain insects and diseases. Um, and in some cases, to uh, breed that crop to be resistant to herbicides that we can then spray for weed control without affecting the crop. Um, we can also do things that might enhance the nutrition of those, those food products. Um, and the classic example of that is a, is a crop called golden rice um, that was um, genetically modified to produce vitamin A. Um, so it has sort of that golden color in the rice, which is not natural, obviously. Uh, but um, in, in third world countries, that's really important. Uh, because the number one cause of um, blindness in children is a vitamin A de deficiency. And if they're eating traditional rice that has no vitamin A in it, um, you can see how if that's their primary food staple, um, how that can create some nutrition problems. Um, so that's one example. Um, and that technology has actually been around for um, over a dozen years um, and is just now being embraced in, in some of those third world countries um, to deal with vitamin A deficiencies. Um, we can also engineer crops to increase yield and improve quality overall. Um, and so those are some of the other things that we do as well. 
Um, interestingly enough, um, this technology has been around for over 25 years and has a track record in the United States. <clears throat> um, we're probably the leading country in the world when it comes to using this technology. Um, in fact, a lot of other first world countries like Russia and, and China really don't even have um, these technologies available to them. Um, and, and I will also point out that um, this is not the same thing as hybridization. You know, hybridization we've been doing for hundreds and hundreds of years, which is basically just selective breeding. You know, we're taking two plants, we're cross-pollinating them in a controlled environment and selecting the best offspring from that controlled pollination. Um, that is not genetic engineering. It, it is manipulating that crop uh, without a doubt, uh, but it's not you know, manipulating those genes in a, in a lab in a sense. Um, so again, um, when you hear the word hybrid, don't just assume that it's genetically engineered. Uh, but also realize that you know, we do use hybrids as a foundation for um, creating some of these genetically engineered crops, but again, it's not the same thing. Um, what's interesting is um, you know, there's a lot of anti-GMO sentiment out there in the news, in the media, especially social media nowadays. Um, and you gotta be, again, be very careful about where you get your information from. Um, and this is an article or a study that was actually done out of Iowa State University looking at uh, social media specifically um, and how other countries, such as uh, Russian State News, um, trying to influence um, or, if you will, sow the seeds of skepticism in different um, you know, things that the U.S. is trying to do, whether it's you know, swaying a general election or you know, uh, consumer preferences on GMOs and that sort of thing. Um, and the abstract of this really is, is sort of a great take home message to make you think about this. Um, and basically it says that it, it, this raises the question of whether Russian views the, the dissemination of anti-GMO information is just one of the many divisive issues it can exploit as part of its information war, or if GMOs serve more expansive disruptive purposes. Distinctive patterns in Russian news provide evidence of a coordinated information campaign that could turn public opinion against genetic engineering. Well, what's the incentive for them to do that? Well, the recent branding of Russian agriculture as the ecologically clean alternative to genetically engineered foods is suggestive of an economic motive behind the information campaign against Western technologies. Um, so you can see there is a motivation for them to do that. Um, and so they're taking advantage of us. They're exploiting our freedom of speech, and it's very easy to do nowadays with the internet. Um, our freedom of speech is probably our greatest strength as a nation and also one of our greatest weaknesses, um, which um, is, is quite true uh, more and more today, it seems like. So ironically, GMOs are not as common as you might think. Um, in fact, there are only 11 crops in the um, United States that are commercially uh, grown. Um, that if you go to the grocery store, you might find one of these on occasion. Um, and here's the list. It's a very short list for the most part. Um, and as you can see, what's interesting is there's a lot of food labels and products out there that are claiming to be GMO free as if there's, you know, as if it's a better alternative to something else. And the classic example for that, I can't drink orange juice in the morning um, in the upper right hand corner there without seeing the label non-GMO verified. Well, interestingly enough, there are no genetically engineered oranges on the market today. It doesn't exist. Uh, that, that hasn't been released. Um, it's not being grown commercially. Um, so, you know, again, you're bombarded with this information. You can't even go to the garden center and buy, you know, raspberry transplants that you have here in the picture uh, without seeing the GMO-free label all over the plants at the garden center. Um, and interestingly enough, enough you're not going to buy a genetically engineered seed or plant or fruit tree or anything at the garden center because you don't have access to that technology uh, from a retail storefront. They don't sell those products to consumers. Um, so you can't buy that at a nursery, even if you wanted to. Um, yet they're marking that and they're playing on people's fears to get you to buy their product or maybe even get a premium price for that because they're claiming it to be GMO free, which has a stigma associated with it. Um, so the crops, the, the dozen crops here that we're looking at, um, you know, soybeans and, uh, were actually one of the first crops released in 1995, um, and they were genetically engineered uh, to be herbicide tolerant specifically. And uh, the main one that you hear um, as far as herbicide tolerance is, is what we call Roundup Ready crops. Um, so um, they're actually, you know, soybeans, cotton, and corn, canola, 
alfalfa even now um, are those herbicide resistant crops uh, that are on the market today. Um, and obviously there's a huge advantage to be able to spray an herbicide like that over the top of the crop to control your weeds. Um, and again, that technology has been around since the late 90s. The other big one that you'll see um, in the footnote there is BT crops. And so BT crops are engineered uh, with a bacterium called Bacillus thuringiensis, so, or BT for short. Um, and some examples of that are soybeans, cotton, <coughs> corn, canola, um, I'm sorry, just the asterisk. Cotton, cotton and corn um, are the main two that are uh, BT crops. And so with those, um, you know, basically they, um, that BT or bacterium only affects caterpillars. And so, for example, corn earworm caterpillars that we feed on the corn and, and uh, affect the yield of that corn. Um, if they eat that crop, um, then the bacterium naturally um, kills that, that caterpillar. Um, and what's interesting is that bacterium is very tar target specific. It only affects um, species in the Lepidoptera family or butterflies, specifically in moths. Um, that are in that larval stage. And um, so it doesn't affect other insects uh, because it is so target specific. Um, and again, it only affects those insects that feed on that particular crop. So, you know, a monarch isn't going to feed on corn. So we don't have to worry about that necessarily. Um, so again, it's very target specific. And by the way, that same bacterium or BT is used in organic production. Um, the organic farmers will spray that bacterium in a solution. Um, on their crops. It's a lot more labor intensive to do it that way, uh, but they get the same results. Um, it's considered a natural or organic um, control option for those, those insects. Um, again, it's very specific. Um, so there are some other examples there of other crops that we could talk about, but those are the two technologies that we're going to talk about today um, in the presentation um, that has a lot of uh, misinformation or concerns regarding pollinators. By the way, um, the GMO topic um, has you know, grown in popularity so much that um, our, food, um, our food processors are jumping on the bandwagon, if you will, when it comes to labeling these products. Um, so if you look in 2009, in the first column there, the number of GMO-free product claims on the market was less than 300 products, okay? Um, and just in, a, in a less than a 10-year time span, um, the number of products on the market that you can go to the grocery store and find uh, as GMO free labeled are over 3,700 products. And, and, and remember, there's only still 11 crops that are genetically engineered. Um, yet you're seeing this label being proliferated on just about everything. So again, it, it's just a labeling thing. It's a marketing thing. And most of the stuff at the grocery store is not genetically engineered. In fact, most of the fresh produce you buy at the grocery store is not genetically engineered. Uh, there's probably not much of an economic incentive to do that um, with those particular crops. It has to be the big crops to justify the cost of that technology. Um, just to kind of, you know, give you a, um, a brief, brief overview, and I could do a whole presentation on just this topic, um, but are GMOs safe? Well, there was a literature review, um, or what they call a meta-study, where they looked at over um, 1,700 scientific records on genetically engineered crop safety. Um, that was over a 10 year time span. Um, they looked at specifically the genetically engineered crops and their interactions with the environment and their interactions with humans and animals from a food safety standpoint. Um, and all those papers that they reviewed, um, they, they looked at it and um, they basically started categorizing the conclusions of each of those papers. And the summary of that, that's this meta study or literature review is basically that the scientific research conducted so far has not detected any significant hazards directly connected with the use of genetically engineered crops. So there's a lot of studies out there. There's a lot of research and a lot of science to back this up. And this science has been replicated many, many times over. Um, so just realize that that's, that's out there. If you want that information, you can dig through that and look at these, these, um, these studies that have been done. So um, one of the big myths um, around you know, bees and pollinators is that you know, they're being affected by you know, pesticides. And, um, and yes, you know, don't get me wrong, pesticides definitely are um, something that can kill pollinators if they're used improperly at the wrong time. Um, timing is so important when we use these pesticides is we have to be very careful from an agricultural standpoint, even from a backyard gardener standpoint, or you know, whether you've got a lawn in your backyard and you're using pesticides that regardless of what they are, 
we've got to be smart about it. We've got to use them appropriately. Um, you don't spray your lawn if it's got clover blooming in it because you got bees that are feeding on that clover. Um, very simply, what you would want to do is you know mow the grass before you spray it. You know if you're going to spray for weeds or whatever. Um, that way you get rid of all the blooms before you spray your lawn. You know it's a very simple practice, but people don't take the time or stop to think about that. You know how's this going to affect our bees and pollinators? Uh, but I would also point out that pesticides are not necessarily the smoking gun here. Okay. And so um, this myth that pesticides are, are being used more so even now with GMO crops is just not true. In fact, the latest advances with genetic engineering allows farmers to use less fertilizer and less pesticides um, while also increasing their yield per acre. Um, so this actually looks at two of the major crops, corn and cotton on this graph um, that are um, genetically engineered crops as we just talked about. Um, and they're probably grown, you know, on more acres than any other crop in the United States. But if you look at the trend uh, from the 1990s, when that technology or genetic engineering first hit the market uh, to now, if you will, um, there's been a decline, a steady decline in the use of insecticides specifically. And insecticides are our biggest concern when it comes to bees and pollinators, right? Um, and so you can see there's a dramatic drop in the number of pounds of insecticides being used per acre. So that's, a, that's an encouraging trend. That's a great benefit of genetic engineering that would not be possible without uh, those crops being engineered to tolerate certain insects and diseases. Um, so again, that's a huge, huge benefit to um, the agricultural industry and to our environment, right? Um, also, I would point out that cotton um, has really come a long ways in the last uh, 20 or 30 years, especially. Uh, prior to the 1980s, um, I had beekeepers in my county that would say that, you know, they would have come within a five mile radius of a cotton field because, you know, the amount of pesticides they had to use for boll weevil control and other insects was just horrendous on bees. And so, you know, you wouldn't want your beehive anywhere close to a cotton field. Well, now I've got beekeepers in my county. We do have cotton up here um, in Bartow County. Um, and they, they don't have any concern putting their bees right in the same cotton field. They'll go out and let those bees forage on, on the uh, nectar and pollen of that cotton crop, and they don't see any issues with it. Um, and so, you know, we've gone from, you know, spraying cotton as much as, you know, 12, 13 times per season with the insecticides. That's just insecticides to maybe only spraying it once or twice at the very beginning of the season. And by the time that crop blooms, those pesticides are long gone. Um, so it's essentially uh, fine to keep your bees near a cotton field nowadays. So we've come a long ways in that regard. So um, just kind of a recap of genetic um, engineering as a general rule. Um, this is another meta study that looks at, um, you know, hundreds of hundreds of papers and studies that have been done out there um, on the benefits or the impacts of genetic engineering. Um, and so as you can see, the number one bar graph there, the first one there is, you know, increases in yield by over 20%. That's across the board, looking at all crops that are out there that have been genetically engineered. Uh, the amount of pesticides that are used, and this is all pesticides, including herbicides, insecticides, fungicides. Um, overall, they've seen a decrease of uh, pesticide use by um, almost 37%. Um, costs, of course, are coming down because you're not using as much pesticides. Um, and so farmers are seeing an increase in profit as a result of that because they're not having to spend as much on input costs. Interestingly enough, farmers aren't getting rich off of this uh, because that is then passed on to consumers with lower food costs. Um, we haven't seen a dramatic increase in our food prices over the last uh, 30 years. Um, so again, that's um, a benefit of genetic engineering. Another benefit of genetic engineering is um, our, our ability to conserve the soil better and uh, reduce our carbon footprint. Um, if we control weeds uh, through chemical measures, you know, using herbicides um, and insecticides for insect control, that requires about 80% less energy than having to me mechanically, you know, cultivate that field for weed control. Um, you know, prior to herbicides, you know, the only way we can control weeds is, is through mechanical cultivation. And as you know, that was the reason that we had the Dust Bowl days in the 1930s. Um, we had soil erosion problems and wind erosion uh, because we were constantly tilling and eroding that soil. Well, now we don't even have to disturb that soil. We've gone from, um, you can see in the, in the upper right hand corner there, 
you know, the number of times you'd have to go across a field with a tractor through conventional measures, you'd have to plow, disc, cultivate, plant, cultivate again for weed control. Um, you'd have to go across that field several times. And now through what they call reduced tillage or even no tillage farming techniques, uh, where they just spray the weeds, they have uh, seed drills that can drill the seed into the ground without having to disturb the soil. Don't have to till it for preparation. Um, this no-till farming technology um, has reduced the amount of erosion issues that we see. Uh, we're actually seeing organic matter being maintained in those in those agricultural uh, situations, um, and it also has reduced our carbon footprint by um, as much as the equivalent of removing four million cars from the road per year because you're not having to go across that field as many times with a tractor implement. Um, so that's another huge benefit of genetic engineering that doesn't uh, get looked at close enough, I think, sometimes. So um, the big myth that I wanted to talk about today was um, GMOs and Roundup Ready crops affect monarchs. Uh, you can Google that and you'll find all kinds of um, interesting articles on this topic. And it's a very complex topic because you know, you're, you're throwing in the genetic engineering side of things. You're talking about pesticides like Roundup. That's of course a hot topic right now in the news. And then you got, you know, a known decline in monarchs occurring simultaneously. And I would just point out that just because, you know, these things are happening at the same time does not mean that they're directly correlated. Okay. But that's the assumption that's made in a lot of the information that you find out there. Um, so let's look at this issue a little more closely. So first of all, I want to start with, with, you know, is Roundup safe? Now, I have a whole presentation on just this. If you ever want me to come at, back and talk about it, um, we can talk about just Roundup for now, okay? And I would point out that, you know, safe is a relative term, okay? Um, nothing is 100% safe, right? Uh, but we do know that the toxicity of Roundup is, is very, very low, especially from an um, environmental standpoint. It uh, has a very safe profile as far as fish, aquatic invertebrates, even honeybees and pollinators is practically non-toxic, okay? And there's tons and tons of literature to back that up. Of all the pesticides on the market today, glyphosate is the least of our concerns when it comes to bees and pollinators, okay? If it's used correctly, uh, the evidence is that glyphosate is not likely to cause any issues, especially from a, you know, the cancer issue is the big thing that's uh, in the news right now. And in fact, there are over 800 scientific studies and numerous regulatories around the entire world Every major you know, FDA and medical association out there concludes that glyphosate is safe for use and does not cause cancer when used according to the label. Okay? The caveat there is you know, make sure you use these things according to the label. That doesn't mean you go out there and, and bare hand you know, your, your Roundup and in your backyard and wear flip flops and shorts. You know, that's, you know, you're just exposing yourself to something that you really don't need to be exposed to, right? But if you wear gloves and you wear, you know, the personal protective equipment that's necessary, you can reduce your chances of cancer, okay? And the analogy I like to use there is, you know, just like when you go out to the beach, right? You're exposed to sun. Well, if you don't protect yourself from sun exposure, you will get skin cancer sooner or later. It's just a matter of time, okay? Um, and all it takes is wearing a hat and, and you know, wearing some sunscreen to protect yourself. It's not that different from the PPE that you need to protect yourself from from pesticides in general. And that's not just Roundup, that's everything that's out there. You should minimize your, your exposure, okay? But regardless of that, even still, it's not known to cause cancer. Um, in fact, a, a judge in California just this week um, overturned California's Proposition 65, which requires you know, pesticides like Roundup to, um, to be labeled as known carcinogens. You know, and, and a lot of products that come out of California, um, you probably see on, on, on the label of everything that says, you know, it's known to cause cancer in the state of California. And that's the Proposition 65 um, that requires that label. Well, um, it, last year, EPA uh, ruled that um, it was illegal for California to put that label on Roundup because it's not known to be uh, a cancer-causing agent. Um, and this week, again, the, um, the judge in California ruled that um, that Proposition 65 would no longer be allowed to um, label uh, Roundup as, as, a, as a known carcinogen because it's just not true. The judge actually said it's misinformation, it's misinformative, and all the studies and all the research that's out there does not substantiate that label. And so, um, so they're, they're slowly, um, you know, regulating uh, or deregulating that product. Um, in a lot of ways. So again, to drill down a little more deeper, 
Um, the other claim that we see with GMOs and Roundup and how they may or may not affect monarchs is the BT issue, um, which we talked about a little bit earlier. Again, you know, this BT um, that's engineered into corn and, and cotton specifically, um, primarily targets the, the caterpillar species of corn earworms and corn borers that feed on those crops. Um, the cotton bowl, um, bowl worm is another one. And so again, those are very specific um, moth species um, that feed on those crops, okay? Interestingly enough, again, monarchs are not gonna be feeding on corn, because you probably know that the primary food source for monarch larvae or caterpillars is milkweed, okay? That's what they have to have to grow and reproduce, okay? So we can pretty much discount that the, the engineering side or the BT genes uh, that again affect certain caterpillars is not necessarily a concern there for, for the monarchs. Um, the other concern is that they're, you know, that Roundup or glyphosate in this case is killing all the milkweed, okay? Well, you know, yeah, Roundup will kill milkweed. And by the way, there's about a hundred other herbicides that are used in agriculture today besides Roundup that will also kill milkweed. Oh, and by the way, um, you know, organic farmers, you know, they have weeds on their farm, you know, they don't use herbicides. They use mechanical tillers to kill their weeds, right? Um, so they're rototilling that soil, and guess what? That kills milkweed too. So we can blame Roundup just as much as any other synthetic herbicide out there or any organic weed control method, even hand pulling weeds on an organic farm is going to kill milkweed, okay? So we can't just blame Roundup as the problem here, okay? So what, what do we know? We know that the decline of monarch, monarch butterflies is primarily due to habitat loss. More specifically, you know, they are a migratory butterfly and their biggest habitat loss is actually in Mexico where they overwinter um, through deforestation. Um, they're losing those forests at a, at a disturbing rate in Mexico and that is affecting their overwintering um, survivability in Mexico. Um, also, you know, this, this loss of habitat is really a very complex issue, okay? Because, you know, we, we are losing habitat that, that benefits, you know, milkweed, milkweed species and other wildfires, right? So we have fewer wild populations of milkweed due to urbanization. And even, you know, you could even argue our agricultural expansion because obviously, you know, farmers are gonna control weeds on their farm regardless of their, of their agricultural system, okay? Uh, so that is a big issue. And again, you, you know, the urbanized side is just as much to blame as the agricultural side in some ways. Um, the loss of overwintering forests in Mexico, as we just talked about. Ironically, um, reforestation in the southeast could be to blame in some cases. Um, as we talked about earlier, we have more trees now because we don't need as much land for cotton and other, other row crops um, being grown in Georgia and the southeast. So all these, you know, planted plantations of pine trees, um, you know, are really not ideal habitat or suitable habitat for wildflowers and milkweed. Um, so in fact, that may actually be displacing, if you will, um, some of the milkweed and other wildflowers uh, for habitat. Um, so we've got more green space, but it's not necessarily the right kind of green space. And then to con you know, add another layer of complexity to that issue, we have a lot of invasive species, things like kudzu and privet and honeysuckle, all these foreign species that are taking over our, our, um, our native habitat and displacing those native plants. That is a huge, huge issue that doesn't get looked at enough. Um, so habitat loss is a very complex issue. You can't just blame one person or one farmer for you know, causing this, this decline in, in habitat. Um, so kind of pointing the finger the other way, um, this is an interesting study that was um, that NASA using their Earth Observatory uh, mapping system. Um, they were looking at, well, how much, how much of the United States is covered in lawn, lawn grasses? And a conservative estimate suggests that there are three times more acres of lawns in the United States than irrigated corn. So if you look at this map, you can see where the clusters of lawns are in the United States. Every major city has a lot of lawn surface area. Uh, so that means that lawns, including residential home lawns, commercial lawns, golf courses, could be considered the single largest irrigated crop in North America in terms of surface area. That should be an eye opener for you, okay? So again, everybody wants to blame the farmers. And so when we talk about the effects of habitat loss on 
on monarch butterflies, maybe we need to be looking at our own backyards instead of blaming farmers. Maybe we need, maybe we don't need as much lawn grass out there. Maybe we just need to take a little corner of our lawn and plant some milkweed or some, some wildflowers uh, to provide some more habitat for our bees and butterflies. Um, that's something that anybody can do in their own backyard. So how can you make a difference here? Um, well, as we just said, you know, plant more pollinator attracting plants. Um, and don't worry so much about how they were grown, you know, organic or not or whatever. That, that's really not a major issue in my book. Um, one of the things that we are looking at now is um, the types of plants that we put in our yard, um, especially native plants are really important, um, even, this, even with something like milkweed, okay? There are a lot of milkweed ornamental type plants that you can buy at the garden center. Most of them, interestingly enough, are tropical milkweed species that are not really good for our migratory butterflies like monarchs because it disrupts their, their natural cycle as far as migration. <clears throat> for, as far as migration. And so it's better to have a milkweed species that's going to bloom at the appropriate time um, and doesn't hang on too late into the fall and into the winter like a tropical species would. Um, that's going to disrupt their migratory pattern. So try to get a native milkweed species if you can. And that's just looking at one type of plant that can make a big difference. Um, obviously, we don't want to spray any pesticides on plants in our, in our landscape, especially when they're in full bloom. There's just no reason to do that. Um, that's definitely going to affect those bees and pollinators if you do it. If you do have to spray a plant in your yard, regardless of the situation, you know, spray later in the evening when those bees and pollinators are less active. Those, most bees and pollinators are active early in the morning. That's the last time you, or that's the time of day you don't want to spray later in the evening, especially if you can use a short residual product that's only going to last a few hours. By the time it dries the next morning, um, it's going to minimize the impact on those bees and pollinators. As much as possible, I'll try to you know, encourage people to avoid just broadcast applications in your backyard. You know, if you got fleas and ticks in your backyard, treat the dog, don't treat the entire backyard uh, because you're putting out more pesticides that are gonna affect a lot of other things inadvertently, especially beneficial insects, um, than if you just treated the dog for those fleas and ticks in the first place. Um, and that's the source of the problem regardless of the situation. So. Um, you know, think about, you know, how you can target your applications to minimize the amount of pesticide you put out there in the environment. And then, you know, when you're looking at different formulations, especially like in a vegetable garden situation, you know, dust and wettable powders are, are, are great insecticides from a safety standpoint. They, you know, it's easy to apply them uh, for us to handle and that sort of thing. Uh, but they're terrible on bees and pollinators because, you know, bees have very fuzzy bodies, pollen, you know, all these butterflies. And so these dusts just really stick to all the hairs on their bodies, just like pollen does, okay? Um, and so that's gonna be carried all the way back to the nest or the hive. Um, and so these, these types of formulations get carried around very readily. Whereas a liquid formulation, a spray, you know, like I said, once it dries, they're not gonna be coming in contact with that as much. And so that's gonna reduce their exposure and the carryover of those products. So stay away from those dust and wettable formulations, especially um, when things are in bloom in your garden. Um, there's a great publication that was put out recently by the uh, State Botanical Garden of Georgia um, that talks about monarch, um, milkweed species that are uh, specific to monarchs um, and those native species that perform really well here in Georgia. Um, they got the fabulous four milkweed, the world milkweed, classifying milkweed, butterfly weed, um, the one here at the bottom is red ring milkweed. Um, those are all different species of milkweed um, that are adapted throughout the entire state of Georgia. Um, and a couple of them that are really good for um, North Georgia, specifically the Eastern Swamp Milkweed, the Mountain Milkweed, and Four Leaf Milkweed. Um, so again, if you want more information about this and want to try to find these particular species of milkweed and you know, add to your backyard habitat, if you will, um, check out this publication from the State Botanical Garden of Georgia. Um, if you want more information on um, you know, protecting our pollinators, um, UGA has a great publication on the uh, entomology website. The link is at the bottom there. Um, and there's another publication that was put out by Oregon State University that, that really gets into um, the science behind reducing bee poisoning from pesticides. Um, it's a really good reference. I'd encourage you to take a look at that. The last myth that I want to talk about today is uh, neonicotinoid pesticides. Um, this is one that's uh, also become a hot topic recently. Um, these are chemicals that um, are synthetic derivatives of nicotine, essentially. Um, so they're called neo as a new nicotinoid. Uh, pesticides. 
Um, they are being blamed for colony collapse disorder in, in, in honeybees specifically. Um, so let's take a look at this one real quick. Um, again, you know, pesticides are part of a very complex equation when it comes to stress and honeybee health. However, individual pesticides such as neonicotinoids are probably the least likely important variable in this equation, even though they are getting a lot of media attention. And, and it's really important to realize that just removing one pesticide from the market probably isn't going to solve the problem and may actually make the problem worse. And the diagram there in the lower corner there shows you how complex this issue is. We know there's a lot of issues affecting honeybees right now. Um, there are nutrition problems, and part of that goes back to habitat loss that we just talked about. Uh, genetic weaknesses, you know, we're breeding these bees to be very docile and easy to work with, and yet we're not selecting for disease resistance and, and parasite tolerance um, as good as we probably should be. And there's a lot of new parasites, a lot of new diseases and viruses and things that are affecting honeybees. And so that genetic weakness is, is catching up with us uh, because we're not breeding them um, as good as we should be um, as far as improving their genetics. So, you know, colony collapse disorder is, you know, very briefly an unexpl unexplained loss of bees. Um, the bees leave the hive, and, but the honey and all the brood are still intact. They just kind of disappear. Um, so those hives will dwindle even in, in sometimes seemingly good conditions from an environmental standpoint. Um, and on average, we're looking at uh, higher than average um, losses. You know, every year beekeepers expect a certain percentage of their hives are going to be lost to just, you know, the weather or whatever, whatever stress is going on, right? Um, but we're talking greater than 20% um, is a sort of a red flag that falls into this colony collapse disorder. And it's sustained from year, one year to the next. So looking at these pesticides specifically, the neonics, I'll call them for short, um, there have been restrictions put on these products in the European Union uh, because of the concern or supposed concern with these particular pesticides. But interestingly enough, um, that did not lead to any improvement in bee health. Um, in fact, the loss rate was twice as high between 2014 and 2015 once the restrictions on these pesticides were in place. Um, and that shows that colony losses are not directly correlated, correlated to the use of neonic pesticides. Also, as another sort of case study example, uh, bee populations are not declining in Australia, interestingly enough, um, despite the uh, country using uh, neonicotinoid, neonicotinoid pesticides extensively. Um, they're one of the top countries in the, in the world as far as using these pesticides. So um, what's the difference there? Well, you know, we use them in the United States and we use them in Australia, but they're not having the same issues as far as colony collapse disorder. Well, one big difference is Australia as a continent does not have varroa mites, uh, which is another, you know, parasite that stresses these bees. So it makes you wonder if, if maybe that's a bigger issue, right? Uh, but at the end of the day, there's not really one smoking gun. Again, it's a very complex, you know, situation. And, and more and more, the science is, is starting to realize that it's, it's a combination of all these, these issues. Weather extremes, invasive species, um, new viruses that are affecting these bees, the, the varroa mites, and even habitat loss. All these things are working together in concert. And that's really the issue. That's the underlying issue. And it's very, very complex. So um, a lot of studies are looking at the varroa mite more and more closely. It's been in the United States now since the early 1980s. It's an invasive species. It's a mite that shouldn't be here, um, but it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a bad one when it comes to bees and, and um, even our native honeybees or native bees are um, affected by this as well. Um, so think about this mite. It's, um, you know, it's like a tick the size of a backpack stuck to, your, to the back of you. Okay, that's how big this thing is. And if you don't think that's stressing a bee, you, you carry a backpack on your back all day long, let it suck blood out of you, and you tell me if you're not stressed at the end of the day. Okay. Um, and also to add sort of another layer of complexity to this, um, a study in 2010 looked at a fungicide, um, a very common fungicide called chlorophalanil. You'll know it under the brand name Dacanil. Um, you can buy that at a lot of local garden centers um, and use that for vegetables and fruits in your garden. It's a great fungicide, has a very low toxicity profile from a human toxicity standpoint. Um, and even from a bee and pollinator standpoint, in and of itself, is not a major issue from a toxicity. Um, but we're finding that that, in combination with other chemicals that they're exposed to, creates some sort of lethal synergy. Um, and specifically, one of the chemicals that bees are exposed to on a regular basis 
to treat for these mites um, is a miticide called fluvalinate. Um, and that's you know, basically a medication that, be, that beekeepers have to put into the hive to control these mites, okay? Well, when the fluvalinate happens to show up in the hive at the same time as this fungicide, chlorothalonil, all of a sudden, you know, the two alone are not an issue for the bees and they can tolerate those chemicals very well, but you put them together, it creates this lethal synergy that's just extremely toxic. And so when you start thinking about that, now all of a sudden there's thousands upon thousands of chemical combinations out there, everything from you know, pesticides to other chemicals in the environment that bees are exposed to on a daily basis. Any, any one of those things by themselves is not a concern, but which one of those two is a concern? You know, and there may be other combinations out there that we just don't know about yet. And so trying to sift through that is gonna take many, many years to try to figure that out. You may see some label changes on things like fungicides being applied near beekeeping, uh, beekeepers um, that have hives and that sort of thing. There may be some label changes that'll try to address that issue. Um, so those are things that we have to be cautious about. Um, our um, expert at the University of Georgia, Dr. Keith Delplane, is um, one of the forefront leading experts in honeybee health in the world. Um, and he basically, um, you know, whenever you hear him give a talk, um, he basically says the answer to colony collapse disorder is um, going to include management decisions. Things like lower density apiaries where we're not putting so many hives together where, you know, mites and viruses and other issues are going to be spreading rapidly between those, those dense apiaries, okay? Integrated pest management adoption, so we're not having to put as many chemicals into the hive to medicate and treat for mites and other diseases. Um, selective breeding programs for those bees is going to be really important to improve the genetics of those bees. Um, and other technologies um, like marker assisted breeding, maybe even genetic engineering could help with that breeding process for bees going forward. So that's kind of the future of beekeeping. And you can see that it's gonna, it's gonna be a challenge for the beekeeping industry to deal with these issues. And, it, and it's a complexity of issues that, you know, like I said, just taking away one pesticide isn't necessarily gonna solve that issue. Um, again, just looking at the toxicity of neonic pesticides very quickly here. Um, they were actually selected in part due to their very low toxicity to, to mammals. Um, in fact, um, if you look at this uh, comparison here, the top uh, one, two, three, four, five chemicals listed there are all different types of neonic uh, chemicals, okay? Di different synthetic derivatives of neonic and tenoid pesticides. Um, and then you compare that to the toxicity of caffeine and table salt. By the way, the, the, the lower the number is, okay, the less it takes to kill you. Okay, and the LD50 value is the, the dose that it takes, or the lethal dose to kill 50% of a rat or rabbit or whatever population you're testing this on, okay? Um, so these neonics are, you know, you're looking at two, 3,000, um, you know, parts per mil or milligrams per kilogram of uh, body weight um, would be the lethal dose there. Um, whereas caffeine, you're only looking at 200 uh, milligrams per kilogram that would be a lethal dose. Okay, so you can kill yourself with caffeine a lot quicker than with these neonic pesticides. So just a summary of some, some studies that have been out there. Um, another meta-study or lit review that was done by the University of Maryland in 2015 concluded that, you know, currently there is wide agreement that the sublethal exposure to uh, these neonic chemicals can cause adverse effects on honeybees in lab studies, but and they put in, um, and I underlined there, no evidence that this widely used insecticide is the major stressor causing colony collapse disorder, okay? So we know that there are some concerns there. It's another stress in the bee environment to some extent, but it's not the smoking gun. Um, our findings agree with the causal analysis that, um, and this was another study that judged neonic pesticides would be unlikely the sole cause of colony declines. And finally, the study makes evident the importance of conducting risk assessment studies on honeybee colonies over longer periods to review those subchronic lethal effects. Okay, um, so the, again, this is something that we need to look at more closely. There's a lot of studies that need to be done to, to answer this question more, more appropriately. But again, taking away one pesticide isn't going to be the issue, isn't going to solve the issue. So, what's an unintended consequence of this? Um, a lot of nurseries now, when you go shopping at, at the local garden center, they're discontinuing. Um, the use of neonic pesticides in order to meet the, the consumer demands. Because consumers are saying, well, you know, I'm hearing all this in the news and I want to I want to make sure I buy plants that are free of these pesticides. And so consumers get what they ask for, is what it boils down to. Okay. Um, 
Um, and there's a lot of environmental groups that are pushing this as well. Well, now they're you know, either not selling these plants at all, and so nurseries are having to change their production practices, um, or they're even labeling, they're going to, so far as labeling these plants, and there's an example of a label that I saw recently at a big box store, um, it says this was treated with neonic pesticides so that you as a consumer can make a choice whether or not you wanna buy that product. And so what are these nurseries doing in reaction? Well, basically if they can't use this product, which by the way is a very great product from a worker safety standpoint, a low toxicity standpoint to applying this in a nursery or greenhouse situation, they're basically having to go back to older pesticides now that have a greater impact on pollinators and worker safety, ironically. Um, so we're actually going backwards now. Okay, we're using older chemistries. Um, that's not where we need to be right now. Okay, and those older chemistries quite often require more pesticide applications because they're not, um, they're, they may be contact pesticides instead of systemic like the neonics. So you're gonna have to use it more often. And so we're putting more pesticides out there that are, that are um, you know, that are even greater concern, okay? And it's gonna cost more to produce them that way too. So is this really what consumers were asking for? And they asked for, oh, we don't want the neonic pesticides. They didn't realize the consequences. So a couple of precautions there, you know, if you use these products in your landscape, again, they're, they're good products, they're safe to use. Don't use them during bloom, okay, very simply. Uh, be careful of drift, um, you know, onto other plants that may be blooming, okay? You gotta be smart about how you use these products. And again, it's a liquid, so once it dries, there's very little concern there for those bees and pesticides, uh, bees and pollinators. Um, use the right rate, read the label, only apply it according to that label. And again, realize that the labels have changed the last few years. And the main label change is it, it puts in big bold print in the big box that says, do not spray when plants are in flower. Okay, that's a very simple thing that we can do to minimize contact with our bees and pollinators. Okay, so it's all about protecting our bees and pollinators and using these, these pesticides responsibly. Also, you know, there's a lot of chemicals out there that we can choose um, that are low toxicity. And so this is a publication you can pull up from the University of Georgia um, that lists a lot of the common chemicals that you might buy at the garden center. And so a lot of these products, you know, a level one risk is um, considered, you know, highly toxic to uh, bees and pollinators. Um, a level three, like this Demolin product down here, is a low toxicity risk to bees and pollinators, okay? Also look at the residual on this last column. You know, a lot of these products only last a couple of hours. And so if I had to choose one of these products, I would use something like a Demolin, if that'll get the job done for whatever insect I'm trying to control. Um, spray it in the evening, and within a couple hours after it dries, it's, it's practically non-toxic to those bees and pollinators. So we can do this, we can manage these pests with the appropriate chemicals applied at the right time um, that are short residual products. So to kind of wrap it up today, um, you know, it's all about, you know, encouraging, you know, bees and pollinators since it is National Pollinator Week. Um, there's a lot of good pollinator-friendly plants you can incorporate into your landscape. Um, realize that you know bees and pollinators need forage and they need pollen and nectar producing plants year round and so we can get that from a variety of trees shrubs annuals and perennials that we can put in our backyard and you got to have things that bloom at different times of the year to provide that forage and that habitat for them year round and the most important time of the year to really add to that bloom period is summer late summer and into the fall when there's less things blooming springtime bees have plenty to you know feed uh, feed on, but um, the later times of the year is where we really need to focus on those those other plants. Um, if you're wanting to select those those trees and shrubs and, and try to figure out when they bloom and make sure that you have something blooming in your yard year round to provide that habitat, um, check out this bulletin from the University of Georgia. Um, and it has a nice glossary in the back that lists all the common um, pollinator plants for Georgia. A lot of these are native species that we recommend. It tells you the bloom times you know, January through December when they're going to bloom. So you could try to pick different things that aren't in your yard to uh, fill the gap, if you will, um, during certain times of the year. So in summary, uh, bee decline is a real problem, uh, but unfortunately it doesn't have a simple answer. Um, so simplistic responses are not going to solve this issue, okay? And I think, uh, I hope that you understand the complexity of, of what we're dealing with now. Um, it is important also to realize that everyone can make a difference. This is something you can do in your own backyard to make a difference. You know, we can all help with expanding the habitat for bees and pollinators. Um, we need to support our local beekeepers. Um, if you have beekeepers that live near you, use your pesticides cautiously. 
um, and, and plant for those pollinators too. And don't spray things when they're in full bloom as we talked about. Um, these are all simple things that anybody can do. Um, those that are beekeepers out there, um, you know, controlling varroa mites and minimizing bee stress on those colonies um, is going to be very, very important going forward because there's a lot of stress out there. Um, climate change is another big one that um, we just don't have any way to deal with that. And so, you know, it's just one more stress that's adding to everything else that's going on out there. Um, so we've got to be very careful about how we manage that from a, from a uh, apiary standpoint. Um, and again, you know, don't just focus on planting flowers in your backyard, but you need to increase the entire habitat. You remember it's food, water, and nesting areas that those bees and pollinators need. Um, you know, just have, simply having a, a bird bath or a small water feature in your backyard, yes, these bees and pollinators have to stop and drink water periodically. Um, so that needs to be part of your, your backyard landscape. Um, nesting areas can be as simple as building a bee box like you see in this picture here. Um, or you know, making sure you have some areas in your landscape that are bare ground, bare soil, so you know, those ground nesting bees and wasps can have you know, places to nest in the ground. Because um, they won't nest if you've got a thick lawn or you've got mulch covering every square inch of your yard, they're not going to nest in those areas. And most of our native bees are ground nesting bees. And so we've got to have, again, places for them to be able to nest and, and survive. Um, so that's kind of my, my summary today. Um, if you want more information on you know, protecting bees and pollinators and adding to your landscape, um, UGA has several really good publications and websites out there um, on this and other topics that we talked about today. Um, so you know, please do check out those, those references. Um, a lot of this stuff, again, is written for Georgia specifically. And so when we recommend plants for Georgia, we're recommending those that are going to survive well in Georgia's heat, and humidity, that are drought tolerant, and they're appropriate for our bees and pollinators. So I'd encourage you to check out those, those resources for more information. Um, so with that, I'll uh, maybe take a couple of questions. I apologize for going a few minutes over today, but um, do we have any questions in the chat box or? So far, there are no questions in the chat box, but if anybody wants a minute to type them in, we can see what's going on. While, I'll, while I look to see if anybody has questions, um, Master Gardeners, you guys are going to meet after this, but we'll end this program after Paul has a chance to answer any questions and we'll log back into our, our link for our Master Gardener meeting um, at 1115. So I don't see any questions, but I'm willing, oh, there's one, okay. Um, do you know of any studies done on the, the mites, the varroa mites, Paul? Oh yeah, yeah, there's a lot of universities that are looking at varroa mites. In fact, we've been learning about these uh, mites, like I said, since the 1980s. Um, and so we know a lot about them. We know their biology, we know how they move, um, and we know you know, what they do to the bees, you know, they are very, very stressful to bee colonies, and, and a lot of times they are, you know, the, the beginning of the end, if you will, for, for a, a honeybee colony. Um, you know, once they get those mites, you know, everything else is just kind of a, a deck of cards that collapses underneath them from, from there on. Um, so beekeepers only have a few products that they can use to manage those mites effectively. Um, it's a fine line between introducing a medication we call them medications, but essentially there are other pesticides to kill those mites um, into the same hive without killing the bees in the process. Um, so our options are limited, uh, but there are some new products coming out um, for, for mite uh, control and management that beekeepers are um, getting access to. And there's a lot of studies looking at new products um, that are you know, less of a concern maybe with that synergistic reaction with other chemicals and things. Um, so, um, you know, EPA is working as fast as they can to, you know, register new products uh, for mite control and, and beekeepers are, are also looking at, you know, other ways to manage mites, you know, trying to breed bees to be more resistant to them. And a lot of these are, you know, behavior driven, you know, bees, bee, um, bee species that are uh, more aggressive at grooming themselves, um, you know, tend to have less of these mite issues and so trying to breed that characteristic in some of these bees. Um, and a lot, of that, a lot of that research is being done at the university level as well. Um, in fact, they're even looking at maybe one day artificially inseminating bees, uh, just like we do cattle and other livestock, um, to try to improve the genetics there as well. Um, so 
There's a lot of exciting things going on in the beekeeping industry right now. A lot of this research is being driven by, interestingly enough, public concern about you know pollinator decline and, and beekeeping and that sort of thing. So, um, so that research is definitely ongoing. Thank you, Paul, for um, uh, talking about that. I, I like that you mentioned um, the treating bees like livestock, because I think that's really typically how they're classified in, in agriculture, because they're they're not really a native, honeybees are not native. Um, so even though they're very important and valuable, that's really an interesting topic. I don't have any other questions in the chat box. Paul, we appreciate you chatting with us today and um, talking with us about food and farming myths and, and how, uh, how the controversy surrounding pollinators tie in. It was really interesting. And um, we'll look forward to seeing you again. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Have a great day. Thanks everybody for coming. Y'all have a great day and um, I will email you a quick survey. I'll also email you some links to some of the references that Paul mentioned um, in his presentation. Y'all have a good one. Bye. Bye. Master Gardeners, if you are not logged out yet, go ahead and log out and grab your other link. I'm going to take a quick five-minute break, but we'll try to get back on at about 11.15.